And here we go. Joining us now on the debate in Stanford, California, Natalie Razgon, psychiatrist at Stanford University. In Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, Salman Akhtar, psychoanalyst and professor at Jefferson Medical College. And here in studio, Quam McKenzie, psychiatrist with CAMH, the Center for Addiction and Mental Health, and Roger McIntyre, the head of the Mood Disorders Psychopharmacological Unit at University Health Network. And of course, we want to welcome back in San Francisco, Ethan Waters, the author of Crazy Like Us, The Globalization of the American Psyche. I want to pick up from where our discussion left off, and Roger, I'll go to you first on this. Uh, the, the penultimate question that I asked before, the notion that there's nothing controversial about our exporting our knowledge of heart disease or how to treat strokes or any, a number of any other things. But Ethan is suggesting you can't say the same thing when it comes to exporting our Western-based knowledge about psychiatry to other parts of the world. Your comment on that, please. Well, my, my reaction uh, is one where I think it reflects a, a stigma that we've had in the field for a long time, that somehow um, you know, tacit to, to, to this exportation of psychiatry being different than other areas of medicine is that there's something defective about the science of psychiatry. You think he's saying that? Well, there's something inherent in that, in that there's something uniquely different about the science of psychiatry when compared to other areas. The notion is categorically false. The, the, the science of psychiatry is, is rigorous. It's uh, meeting standards that would meet regulatory bodies. And uh, most, uh, most scientists would, 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 would sort of appeal that this is, in fact, uh, not only good science, but science that has meaningful translation. Your question was actually the zinger, Steve. What's different about exporting penicillin versus insulin versus heart medications and versus psychiatric treatments? There's lots of examples where we have uh, science that's gone in the wrong direction in all of these areas. But do you throw it all out? Is it, is it baby in the bath while you throw it all out? Does that speak for all science? No, it doesn't. Okay, well, and, and I think that's really the critical part of, of that argument. The tough part for Ethan here is that he's going to have to listen to the, to the rest of you opine on his work while he's sitting tight. And then, Ethan, I, I promise I'll get back to you and I'll, I'll let you comment on everything that you've heard. Solomon, can I get you to uh, weigh in on this as well? Well, uh, I must say that uh, I am by and large sympathetic to Mr. Waters' uh, hypothesis. I think he has something meaningful and good to say. Uh, however, uh, just like it happens uh, in this kind of writing and this kind of debate, one gets uh, carried away and uh, takes an extreme position. So, for example, uh, the idea that uh, somehow American psychiatry and drug companies have brainwashed the East or underdeveloped countries may have a bit of kernel of truth and an unfortunate kernel of truth. However, there are two other factors uh, uh, that are overlooked in this hypothesis. One is that uh, these underdeveloped countries are not one thing. They have multiple social strata. And as the social strata are changing and nuclear family structures are changing, illnesses are changing. So it's not only that a new diagnosis has been brought from abroad, it's also the new diagnosis may actually be now born in that country because that country is becoming family structure-wise, child-rearing-wise like that. So that's the second thing. And the third thing is, what is also overlooked is, it's not that these countries are tabula rasa. There is also a post-colonial hunger for white people's opinion, and therefore an overvaluation and premium on white people's opinion, and therefore buying these opinions. So somebody is selling opinions, but please understand there's somebody buying opinions also. I'll give one two-sentence example. Some years ago, I was asked by Indian Psychiatric Society to arrange something for them, a seminar on psychotherapy or something. I thought that I will ask some of the people who were raised in India and trained here in psychoanalysis and psychotherapy to go there and teach. They were not interested. They only wanted white people. You see? So there is a lot of post-colonialism also. Just like there's a push factor, there's also a pull factor into this. Okay, lots of stuff to come I'm, back to yeah. here. Lots of stuff to come yeah. back to here. Uh, Natalie Razin, let me get your view on the uh, major hypothesis that uh, Ethan Waters is trying to advance tonight. Well, uh, let's say it this way. Uh, there, there is certainly some truth about the imperialization of the world in general uh, and dominance of the Western culture. But said that, I think to, to the point of this specific question which you brought up uh, of exporting heart disease knowledge and diabetes knowledge and not exporting the mental illness knowledge, 
I guess what we need to start thinking about is about how pervasive mental illness really is because 60% of people with cardiovascular disease have comorbidity with depression and it's pretty similar percentages for diabetes, for example. In fact, there are a number of studies going on now to try to understand the current underpinnings be between the two types of illnesses, illnesses of cardiovascular disease and illnesses of mood. So I think that the notion that that brain is somehow isolated and whatever brain, brain function is perceived is, is strictly cultural, I think it's, it's a slightly reductionistic knowledge. What I would suggest to do is to say that there are a number of uh, concepts which are cross-culturally not uh, as adapted by us, and it's definitely a, a lack on our part, and we, we should involve more of a cross-cultural psychiatrist in the development of a illness concept, because we unfortunately have a significant preponderance of mental illness. But to say that this is just, you know, a unique and negative way to uh, export the illness, I think it's, it's really erroneous. Okay, Quinn McKenzie, what are you going to add to the mix? Well, I think that uh, I'd like to thank Ethan for starting the debate, because this is a debate that has been going on almost behind closed doors for a while, and now is out in the open and people are discussing it. So thank you very much, Ethan, for that. Uh, I think that we need to think about what we're trying to do. Most people with a mental health problem in Canada or in the developed world or in uh, low-income countries do not get any treatment whether it's traditional treatment or Western treatment, most people don't get treatment. So if we're going to export something, the question is, are we going to export something that people can use and will expand the number of people who actually get some treatment? One of the problems we have is the preponderance of a treatment, drug treatment for depression, which is useful for some people, but most people with depression it's not that useful for. If we were going to export our knowledge, it wouldn't only, we should be thinking about not just it, thinking about the drug knowledge, but thinking about the other modalities such as co uh, culturally adapting, cognitive behavioral therapy, so a talking you're therapy. This, then. You agree with him on that part of it? I'm saying if we've got something that works uh, and the span of things that, we, that work, not just the drugs, then we should think about whether they can be adapted to be used elsewhere. I think it's a useful thing to do. I think the drugs are just one thing. Okay, Ethan, a number of uh, observations slash criticisms there that you may want to pick up on. Go ahead. Sure. Well, let me start with the, the first one, the idea that I, I don't respect the, the field of psychiatry as a science. And, I, and I, I really certainly do. In fact, most of the people I profile in the book who are thinking along these lines are themselves psychiatrists. And on a, just a personal note, my wife is, is a psychiatrist herself. I have tremendous uh, respect for the field. But I do think it is fundamentally in one way different than medicine, which is that it's very clear if you look across history that the ideas that surround the descriptions of these mental illnesses shape the mental illness itself. And I'll give you just a couple, two examples. If you look across history, this sometimes becomes very clear. If you look to Victorian era England, for instance, and you see the thousands upon thousands of women that suffered from hysterical leg paralysis. Or if you look just 15 years ago to the recovered memory controversy here in the United States and the rise, of multiple, rise and fall of multiple personality disorder, um, you can clearly see that when the mind becomes troubled, it looks to cultural cues to understand what is going to happen next and to how to shape those symptoms. And Edward Shorter, also of the University of Toronto, gave, the, gave me this idea about symptom pools, that in any given time in history, there'll be a symptom pool by which the unconscious mind will be directed towards certain ideas and behavior. And those ideas, those symptom pools change over time. And critical to creating and maintaining those symptom pools is the mental health profession itself. So I think in that way, uh, that interaction between the mental health profession and the shaping of the symptoms and the beliefs around the mind and the mental illness is, is, does make it fundamentally different than medicine. Okay, I should follow up with this. Your wife, the psychiatrist, <clears throat> has she read the book? Oh, yes, yeah. Well, I think uh, she read the book and has been extremely <laughs> supportive. I don't think of it as a book that is uniformly critical of the profession. I think of it as highlighting people within the profession who um, may not be getting the, the, the sort of airtime that, uh, that they deserve, the people that are thinking about these issues cross-culturally that are not, uh, you know, uh, the handmaidens of the drug companies and getting No, I understand. The, the, the but just to confirm, she's still speaking to you, right? <laughs> yes, yes. Okay, just wanted to check, just wanted to check. Just wanted to check. Okay, Roger, you wanted to follow? Yeah, I think that, you know, one needs to step back and ask, well, what, is, what is psychiatry attempting to export? What psychiatry is attempting to export 
is a compassion and a wish to relieve distress and suffering. And the field is an erudite field, a field uh, populated with highly compassionate people who enter into zones that have been traumatized with a primary aim to relieve suffering. But well, you would acknowledge that they might unintentionally not have the effect that they seek to have. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And that would go in, in any area of medicine. Sure. I think you know, it wouldn't be unique to psychiatry. Uh, but the, the field's attempting to export uh, uh, an attempt to alleviate the suffering. And I think that can't be lost in the discussion. Um, I think what we need to be very clear on is that th this idea of symptom pools is not unique to psychiatry. In fact, cardiovascular disease, infectious disease, diabetes look very different across different cultures, which is allegedly the same, uh, same organism or same disease. So the fact that culture affects the language, the lingua franca, is not unique to psychiatry. I think that what is, 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 is implied here, at least how, what I'm hearing, is that the exportation of a psychotherapy in the case of entering a trauma zone or the exportation of a somatic therapy of medication is inherently flawed. I, I don't. I think there's a, there's a premise I wouldn't agree with. Can I, think, I just let, yeah. let's check? Are you saying that, Ethan? In fact, as the way Roger's putting well, it forward. Let's, let's, right. Let's take a quick. Let's take an example of, of of one of those modalities that was exported to Sri Lanka. It was the, it, it was called critical incident debriefing, and this was a particularly American notion that right after a trauma, within a few days or a few weeks, that it was helpful for the person to go through a uh, sort of emotional venting. Uh, you know, it, within a, a, maybe a group setting or with a counselor, you would relive the trauma and try to sort of uh, clean, you know, sort of express the emotions that happened during the trauma. Now, that was a, that was a Western idea that, that, that turns out not only to not make sense in, in other cultures, but also the, 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 the science behind it here has shown that not only is it by and large ineffective, but in several studies it's shown that people that go through that critical incident debriefing after a trauma actually do worse over time. So no doubt that the, that the intentions are fine, but the extent to which trauma and psychological healing is wrapped up in this culture is, I think, underappreciated by the people that rush into a disaster zone. For instance, you know, not knowing the language or any of the rituals or any of the, the cultural history and attempt to do something like critical incident debriefing. Okay, let's get some feedback. Natalie, I know, wants in, and uh, Quam will go to you next after I that. Go ahead, Natalie. Actually, I agree. I completely agree about uh, with that concept of uh, c cultural specif specificity because I can tell you, uh, first ten years of my practice in medicine uh, was done in Russia, and uh, I distinctly remember how women who would be diagnosed with cancer would not uh, want to hear that diagnosis. In fact, it was uh, both genders uh, similar inability to hear that they may have a potentially lethal condition and uh, other cultures for example in China it's very similar inability to tolerate something very critical in the United States in the Western world people would be very upset at the physician if he would not give them the proper diagnosis and the certain expectation of, of uh, life but um, I, I do believe that uh, we cannot, as, as Roger said, throw the uh, baby out with the, ba with the bath water because uh, maybe this specific example is a very good illustration how Western, Western methods mm -hmm. of intervention are not helpful. But the fact that there were people who were helping or attempting to bring certain, certain cohesion after a terrible uh, event are uh, important and you th I think we've seen that in Haiti right now when people are asking for more help so something they are draw drawing from it and I guess the question would be uh, why are they buying if if they are not interested if, if there is a salesperson so to speak there is a consumer who is willing to buy it Gwen McKenzie. Well, people are buying things because there are not enough, uh, there's not enough uh, service around, so people are desperate for a service. But I do think that we have to be a bit careful here. If we're going to this sort of, it's good intentions, it's well intended, so that's good enough, is not good enough. If we're real scientists and we're doctors, we first do no harm. And that means we have to understand what the impact is of what we're doing. Now we know that when we're treating psychological illnesses, there's a biological treatment, there's a social treatment, and there's a psychological treatment for almost everything. And the biological treatment is usually, uh, the, actually often the most minimally effective part of it. It's the social yeah. and psychological. If you do not understand the culture, you cannot optimize 
the social and the psychological, so you're not treating things properly. And you may do harm. Good intentions are not good enough. First, first and foremost, do no yeah. harm. Do no harm. Salman, let's hear from you. Well, I think that we are talking about a large number of things at the same time. So uh, we can sort it out. Uh, I had a list of five, but I'll stay with the first two. First, I think we are talking about whether psychiatry is a science or is not a science. And uh, the implication is that there is something very good about it being a science and something perhaps not so good about it being not a science. I think psychiatry is some aspects of it are scientific, some aspects of it are not scientific and that's okay too. Because not science does not mean bad. Not science can also be very, very good stuff. Poetry, love, uh, all kinds of things that are not scientific can affect people and change people. So I think psychiatry is an odd mixture of science and not science. That's one. And to uh, push it one or the other direction is problematic. The second, I think even more important question that is inherent in what we are struggling with is are human beings fundamentally same all over the world or are human beings and human problems different all over the world? And I think that the people who uh, uh, have the DSM-4, DSM-5, and 6, 7, 8 mentality, they tend to think that all human beings are fundamentally same and therefore their problems are same. On the other hand, uh, uh, Mr. Waters is suggesting that uh, people are different. And once again, it is not a matter of black and white, unfortunately, although that sounds better for a debate. The fact is human beings are same in many ways and different in many ways. They are same in so far as all human problems, all human problems, regardless of whether people are black or white, Jewish or Christian, Muslim or Hindu, East or West, all human problems fundamentally can be reduced to two problems. One is human beings struggle with what is impossible. And the fact and the tragedy that some things are impossible. That's one problem that human beings struggle with. The second problem that human beings struggle with is that a few other things which are possible are prohibited. Now, those two problems hurt human beings. In that, human beings are alike because all human beings struggle with these two problems. The problem of impossibility and the problem of prohibition. In finding solutions to how to bear these problems, human beings are different. So I think that this splitting of science and art and uh, similarity and difference is an artificial didactic splitting which wouldn't lead to a successful understanding till the time we are willing to rise above or sink below this kind of either or thinking. Okay, let's get a response from Ethan and then we'll go to Roger for a response after that. Well, I, I thought that was very well said. I do think that humans, there, there's a spectrum of similarity and differences. I think that what we're missing uh, and we fail to understand when we go into other cultures is uh, that this information, there's no way to stop globalization of these ideas. There's, it's just too, too big a force. But at least as we go into other cultures, we can begin to sort of look to the narratives and beliefs and ideas that already exist in those places and say, Let's understand the value of those things before we impose our notions, our categories, our treatments, our ideas. Let's understand what's working here. And perhaps the, the, the dialogue can then go both ways about uh, understanding uh, human health and illness and happiness. Roger. May, may it, I say one thing, please? Okay, Salman, so quick, please? come back and then to Roger. I'll be very quick. I, I go for the last four or five years. My wife is also a psychoanalyst. We go and teach in Delhi. And what we have found is that psychoanalysis and psychoanalytically derived psychotherapies are applicable to some people completely unmodified, are not applicable to some people unmodified and have to be textured and nuanced, and are not applicable to some people. Do you see? So we find it all kinds of admixture of variations uh, in what can be transported, what has to be modified, and what cannot be transported. Roger. Yeah, I think what makes this conversation so complicated was spoken to earlier. That's we need to disaggregate the, the issues that we're talking about here. Um, let me just speak to two issues specifically. The issue about um, do we have an ability to predict who's going to respond or who's going to have a side effect to an intervention? We don't need to go to Hong Kong. We don't need to go anywhere in the world. I here in Canada cannot predict who's going to respond to medication. I can't predict who's going to respond to psychotherapy. These are treatments that are largely developed here in North America. So there's a larger scientific challenge we have, and that is trying to find who's going to respond to what and who's going to have side effects to what. And indeed, culture plays in that, but we have an even more fundamental issue than that. The second issue, which is sort of, uh, sort of 
um, is sort of interdigitating this conversation, is there a critique of capitalism here? And the idiom of that critique being the pharmaceutical companies and their marketing and some of the uh, shenanigans that they're up to. Th that needs to be kept disaggregated and clearly disaggregated from what we're trying to talk about here. But on the issue of going into a, a, a trauma zone and attempting to identify, does this treatment effectively resolve distress locally? That's something we struggle with in downtown Toronto, downtown San Francisco, downtown New York. I can't predict who's going to respond, who's going to decide affect anything. Sure. Yeah, but the, the research is really clear that if you send a bunch of trauma counselors in, you are going to do more harm than good. That's what the research shows. It shows it in the army, it shows it in uh, post-war zones, it shows it post-hurricanes. And yet that's our first instinct. And yeah. it's wrong. Yeah, so if, in, yeah, in, there's, no, there's no question that the science has shown that there are in fact some examples where perhaps a modality that was intended turned out not to be the right, the right way to go. But to, to take that as uh, sort of a, uh, as a, a justification for a broad statement that we shouldn't be exporting any modality of treatment I think is misguided. Yeah. I'd, I'd, let me follow up with Natalie on something. One of the themes in Ethan's book is that Western psychiatry can learn something from non-Western cultures. For example, we brought up the issue of schizophrenia before. What's your thinking behind that? Well, um, it's, it's a fascinating uh, book, actually, Ethan, and I have to congratulate you on that. I, I read it uh, in 36 hours on, and uh, had a hard time <laughs> putting it page down. Down. So, so it's, it's a great accomplishment in itself, and I'm very excited to be part of that discussion. Uh, that said, you know, talking about schizophrenia and, in general, the significant major mental illnesses as bipolar disorder, mood disorders, and schizophrenia, and uh, bringing it in a cultural context is, is a very complicated matter. So uh, one of the criticisms which uh, I heard in, or read in the book were about the DSM and the fact that everything is so classified and um, kind of sh shelved into small, small shelves, uh, where, whereas there's so much more range to the individual uh, presentation of the illness, which is something we, we don't ever dispute. But I think what, one of the more important issues is to look at what is the real meaning, a concept of schizophrenia, for example, in Zanzibar versus the United States or England. Uh, you, you bring up issues of people being uh, more accepted as they are very ill and have very aberrant behaviors. And by acceptance, it improves their outcome. There's no question about that, and I would never argue that point. Nobody, I don't think, would. But I think one of the concepts forgotten behind the developing the classification, such as DSM, for example, is exactly aimed at reduction of stigma and exactly aimed at incorporation of the mental illness among other illnesses and therefore making it less scary. Because if you think historically, there are a number of uh, countries in the Western civilizations which treated people with severe mental illness in asylums. And that goes back not just to England, but to other European countries. And then uh, even nowadays in the United States, if you look at the departments of psychiatry, they are quite often occupying separate buildings. What does it say? It could be, you can say just, you know, an architectural plan for the hospital or medical center, or it could be just a difficulty in accepting aberrant behavior. Mm -hmm. But looking at the baseline of what, what warrants the acceptance versus non-acceptance, I think it's very important. When you have a, a 600 square feet apartment where 30 people live in Zanzibar, almost never, nobody works there or make menial wages, and accepting a person who has delusions and uh, hallucinations in that environment is very different as to accept people uh, who have certain level of functioning going to college and living in a community with okay. very complicated tasks <clears throat> and so social structure and so then let me jump in for a second out Natalie. of that structure. Thank you. Let, let uh, Ethan stand by one second. Quam wants a word on this and then we'll get you to respond to both comments. Just a very concrete example. Uh, we find that uh, 10 to 20 percent of women get postpartum depression in the West. We tend to treat it with uh, support and psychotherapy and drugs. That's what we do. If you look in China and you look in Hong Kong and you look at some African countries, you find, and especially if you look in Fiji, 
you find very few women get postpartum depression. When you analyze it and you analyze what's going on, you find that in places like Britain where I was and in uh, the US and in Canada, after the baby's born, the support tends to be focused on the child, making sure the child's growing properly, making sure they're breastfeeding, measuring the child, and doing all of those sorts of things. In these other places where there's a very low postpartum depression, the focus is on the mother. All the support is to the mother, and they trust the mother to do the right thing. But all the support is geared towards the mother. No housework, people cooking for the mother, somebody brought in to help the mother. When they incorporated that in the West Midlands in the UK, they changed the focus, they stopped measuring the baby, they started supporting the mother. They decreased postpartum depression by 50%, hmm. the West Midlands of England. They learned from low-income countries, incorporated it into the Western uh, world, and they found that it made a difference. Ethan, your responses. I think that's a very interesting example of how we could learn mm. from other cultures. And, you know, going back to the comment before that, the idea that, the, you know, again, that the biomedical idea of mental illness, that it's a mental illness like any other, will reduce stigma is simply not, unfortunately, borne out by the, by the research. Everywhere you look at the adoption of that idea, you find countries and people wanting more social distance from the ill person, wanting, you know, thinking of them as more dangerous and unpredictable. <clears throat> it's just an example of how uh, these messages and these ideas are, that surround mental illness can carry ideas that we, don't under, that we don't quite understand that they're carrying. They can be very subtle and sort of subterranean. And indeed, people can say, oh, I, I now believe in the biomedical notion of mental illness. I am a more accepting person of mentally ill, and then go and act in an entirely different way, which is what they've, they've found. So uh, we, ha we have to be very careful about, the, uh, about how we spread these things and what they ultimately will do in another culture. Roger, let me turn the page here and ask you about another example, because you, you've taught in Arab countries, right? I you sure spent have. some time there. Yeah. Who, who, countries which may not share our familiarity or our belief in mental illness the way we do here. What does it mean to live in a culture that doesn't either recognize mental illness or certainly doesn't regard it, let's say, the same way that we do here in the West? Well, I think what it does is it leaves people untreated. Um, there's no reason to assume that people in these parts of the world or elsewhere are not suffering from some type of condition. And the language that has been provided to them gives them an opportunity to communicate that language to a health care provider. What I've been struck by, uh, Steve, when I've traveled to the Middle East and other parts of the world is uh, not only the exportation of our language, but the exportation of other things. We've exported urbanicity, we've exported the middle class, we've also exported democracy. And I think that Ethan has to be congratulated because he has stimulated my mind into thinking about other demographic shifts that have occurred. The UN reported in 2007 that the population for the first time became largely urbanized. Urban. Mm -hmm. Last year, The Economist magazine reported for the first time the majority of the world's population was middle class. So we're not just exporting the APA, the American Psychiatric Association, we're exporting urbanicity, we're exporting uh, democracy, we're also exporting the middle class. And there's plenty of research to show that these social factors, at least urbanicity and economics, play a role in mental illness. And so uh, I welcomed that sort of uh, 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 sort of thinking, and when I visit middle, the Middle East, other parts of the world, this is in fact uh, what one is struck by is the want for the middle class, the want for democracy, the want for uh, some of these uh, Western notions. But urbanicity, Actually, uh, or, be, or being born and brought up in a city, is the biggest risk factor for Absolutely. developing schizophrenia. Mm. Absolutely. It increases your chance of depression. Absolutely. And uh, it actually also increases the chance of uh, uh, violence in the home. So And alcohol and drug and abuse. And alcohol, drug Absolutely. And so urbanicity is a powerful factor that is uh, spread worldwide and could account for some of the upward trajectory of mental illness that we, that we see. Natalie, you wanted in on that? I wanted in on that on two points, and one point would be about the what Roger was just bringing up, bringing up about the um, uh, countries where, where there's completely different social structure and completely different uh, view of the mental illness. And I have a student 
uh, here at Stanford who uh, actually is doing a study looking at the rates of depression among Muslim American women in relation to their uh, to the availability of mental health care to them. And her preliminary findings were reported last year at the American Association uh, meeting. Uh, and basically, her findings so far, based on the questionnaires which she distributed among the various uh, types of American Muslim uh, communities, it suggests that women who have a better understanding of the mental illness mm. and better access to the mental he health care provision in the United States have much lower rates of depression. So that's one. The other one, uh, what I wanted to say is that, you know, when you think about the de democracy versus the society with a very, very rigid and, and uh, tyrannic or very mon mon monolithic uh, political structure, those are so different. And I can attest to that being, again, coming from a, a country which had clearly a very rigid social and political structure. I think that that notion of bringing democracy, and this is back to what Roger just said, is definitely bringing in itself inherently the more notion for um, mental illness. Quinn, let me turn the yeah, tables on you a little bit here, if, if I may, and then, uh, sorry, who was trying to get in out of town, and we'll go to you I, after I, that? I, I just, okay, want, yeah, I just wanted to say a couple things. Stand by, and I'll get to you in a second. I can wait, yeah. Yeah, I can wait. Let's bring the conversation home for a sec here, Quam. Tell me, evaluate this situation for me. An immigrant who feels ill at ease in our society opts to visit a quote-unquote native healer rather than go to a Western-trained psychiatrist or psychologist to help with whatever distress they're experiencing. How would you regard that situation? I would regard that as completely normal because when we become ill and we become distressed, the first thing we all do is we uh, try and deal with it the best way we can. We talk to family, we talk to friends, and it's only when family and friends don't deal with it that we go to somewhere else. Then we sometimes go to our uh, family physician. But I tell you, most of us don't. We go to yoga, we go to Reiki, we go to massage, mm -hmm. and all the studies in the US have shown that it's the white Americans who are more likely to use complementary therapies than the immigrants. And then, if that doesn't work and we've gone to primary care and that hasn't worked either, then we see a psychiatrist. So that pathway to care of deciding to go down the route of a native healer or whatever isn't a problem. The question is whether you can make sure that those native healers, the chiropractors, the massage therapists are actually any good. Gotcha. Salman, you wanted to say? A couple of things. One is about when we say the view of mental illness, see, I think that's a too big a term. I think when it comes down to the extreme right, that means the severe mental illness, psychosis, hallucinations, delusions, dementia, uh, severe schizophrenia, etc., catatonic stupor, I don't think that uh, uh, you know, there might be some rare esoteric uh, cultures where they might, are not recognized. But by and large, in the world, in, whether it's in Middle East or Far East or West uh, or Latin America, major mental illness, I don't think there's any serious disagreement that this person is really not well. I think it's when we begin to move towards a spectrum of minor depressions, day-to-day -day anxieties, adjustment disorders, marital dysfunctions, personality disorders, then trouble begins because then all kind of cultural lens comes into being. So I think that to say mental illness versus no mental illness or a view of mental illness there and view of mental illness here is too big a chunk. That's one. The second thing is when we, same thing with urbanicity. Being urban, I think, is again a big category. What ultimately boils down to is the issue of nuclear family versus extended family and intra-community alienation as to if you live on a street, if you live in an apartment building, how many people know you? How many people do you know? How many people can you go into the house uninvited and who will drop in? And at 2 o'clock at night, if you have abdominal pain, who will take care of the family and who will take you to the hospital? I think those kind of intra-community alienation and nuclear family. And, of course, we must also add in the mix the loss of religion. You know, religion has its own problems, 
but religion has its own advantages also. And I think the loss of religion in some communities also causes lack of support for human beings and causes a, a big mix up. Okay, let me jump in here because we're literally down to our last few minutes here and I want to put one last thing on the table. And Michael, if you would, let's queue up this public service announcement. This is from the Canadian Mental Health Association. I'm going to do a bit of a setup here because our guests out of town won't see it, they'll just hear it. A woman's in an office. Someone's about to walk into the office and visit her and give her some information. This is a public service announcement conveying how we ought to think about mental health. We're going to play this and then come back and chat briefly. Roll tape, please. I didn't see you come in. Yeah, most people don't. Who are you? Oh, I'm depression, and I've come for you. <laughs> I'm not depressed. Oh, you're not. What about schizophrenia? No. Anxiety disorders? Uh-uh. Uh, eating or mood disorders? No and no. Oh, my mistake. It's next Tuesday that you lose your job and your boyfriend leaves you. And the tagline is there, change the way you think. Uh, Ethan, let me go to you first on this. And, uh, you know, we've just got a few minutes here, so briefly, if you would, so we can get as many people in on this as possible. Does it make us more empathetic to this entire subject if we are told that, potentially, we are all victims of mental illness? I suppose, but that, I mean, that ad is truly spooky, and it goes to the fundamental point of, uh, you know, that, that there are entities out there that will, it, given certain life circumstances, want to categorize your behavior and your feelings, and they will give you the diagnosis, uh, and that, you know, we in the West are uh, pathologizing huge swaths of human existence. I mean, in America, it's, it's the American uh, Mental Health Institute says that one quarter of Americans have a diagnosable mental illness every year. So. Uh, this is a, a cultural trend, uh, certainly, but one I think we should be very wary about exporting to the rest of the world. Roger, what would you think of it? I think the commercial is a little bit, uh, uh, say, causes me a bit of disquiet. It's not the way I would uh, conduct a commercial. Uh, the key message I think here, Steve, is as follows, is that uh, we do uh, know that there is persistent, severe mental illness, and it's consistent in many, many cultures. The point is well taken that that gray zone, the so-called so sub-syndrome or a milder psychiatric presentations, that's where we're struggling, where to define what is and what is mental illness, how to operationalize dysfunction. Natalie? Well, what I would say is that uh, supporting the cross-cultural and uh, cultural-specific responses to mental illness, I would say that uh, it's all back to the, what is the background of that? If you have a famine in the country and extreme poverty and uh, people's life is worth of nickel, it's, it's a completely different perception of witnessing a catastrophe or losing a loved one versus uh, a society where everyone is feeling very entitled or uh, is given certain uh, benefits which sure. at some point are taken for granted. So I would say that you do need to have a differential understanding of how how it could be pathologized versus normalized. Understood. But I'm, forgive me for jumping in. I want to make sure everybody gets a chance on this. So, uh, Selman, enormous, enormous amount I, of untreated I, mental Selman, illness. your view on this? I am uh, very sympathetic to what Mr. Waters says, and I'm in agreement with him. Because take one example. Is the smoking cigarettes a mental illness? Do you see hmm. the problem? Uh, the fact is, uh, it is not a sane thing to smoke cigarettes. <laughs> but we will decide where we draw the line and where we let people off, you know. And I think that line is what is determined by cultural factors. Uh, so in that way, I'm in full sympathy with and admiration of Mr. Waters. Okay, last 20 seconds to quam. I think that we've been looking outside when we could be looking inside. We're in the mo most diverse city in the world. And what we've got to start thinking is about how the different cultures in uh, Toronto should be shaping our views of mental health here and now and how we should be offering services to people here. I want to thank everybody for a most erudite discussion tonight on TVO. Ethan Waters, starting with you and your book, Crazy Like Us, The Globalization of the American Psyche. Thank you so much for joining us from San Francisco. Thank you. Natalie Rasgon, the psychiatrist at the Stanford School in Stanford, California. Salman Akhtar, the psychoanalyst at the Jefferson Medical College in Philadelphia. And here in Toronto, Quam McKenzie from CAMH. Roger McIntyre from the um, Pharmacology at UHN University of Toronto. Thanks so much, everybody.